Okay, so our, our presenters for the next presentation are Martin Coles and Alexia Grittani. Uh, Martin is a forensic engineer in Edmonton, Alberta. He has over 15 years of industry experience. He's completed over 450 forensic investigations. He's been accepted as an expert witness in court. His technical specialties include a fire investigation, electrical and electronic failures, product liability, and alarm system analysis. I should also add uh, forensic engineer, uh, also a certified fire and explosion investigator. Uh, our next presenter is Alexa Britani. Alexa is also a certified fire and explosion investigator, certified vehicle fire investigator, uh, engineering EIT. Uh, she's got her bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Waterloo master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Toronto and she's attended and investigated over 200 fire scenes. Uh, so Martin is going to be starting us off. So Martin, please, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks very much, Mark. And uh, thanks for everybody who uh, who's participating in today's webinar. Uh, this, is, uh, this is always a great event. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some of the more indirect impacts of CAD events. Um, while they are serious and extensive, the CAD event itself is often pretty straightforward from a forensic point of view. Um, but what about the less direct effects? Um, these kinds of effects include things like power outages, um, contamination, waterborne or airborne, um, a reduction in design safety factors, among other things. Uh, I'm also going to touch on some of the effects that we are experiencing from climate change. Some of these fall under the umbrella of the examples I've already given you, um, and some are some are a little bit separate. So one of the big things that we're seeing um, is uh, that jurisdictions all over North America um, and elsewhere are experiencing ongoing stresses on power grids. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Some of the stress comes from increased demand. Um, we're also undergoing a transition from a highly centralized generation model to a more distributed decentralized generation model as more and more renewables come online. Regulators, of course, are having some challenges with, uh, with that transition. So we can get into some more specific examples of the impacts on the power grid. Um, extreme weather has put major strains on grids in recent years in places like Texas, here in Alberta where I am, as well as others. And uh, this kind of weather is like either extreme cold or extreme heat um, has similar effects on our power grids, um, as well as flooding, um, which is often associated with extreme wedding, weather events. Um, and that can damage critical infrastructure, impacting our ability to compensate for it by transporting oil and fuels as well as the initial uh, disruption of power transmission. So here's an example that was uh, pretty close to close to home for me this past winter. Um, we had a pretty prolonged period of extreme cold this past January. Um, we had temperatures ranging from um, about minus 40 to close to minus 50 in the more rural areas and uh, some places were experiencing wind chill values near minus 55. Um, so during that period, uh, Alberta set a record of peak electricity com consumption at uh, just over 12 megawatts. Um, and so this really pushed our power generation capacity to the limit. Um, even though much of our home and building heating capacity in this province comes directly from burning natural gas, we did see enormous demand due to very high use of supplemental heating, like uh, things like indoor space heaters, vehicle block heaters, um, as well as uh, outdoor applications like livestock heaters, industrial heating, and uh, freeze protection systems. So the entire province received um, this emergency alert on our phones, warning us of the strain on the grid. Um, and it tells, told us that extreme cold resulting in high power demand has placed the Alberta grid at high risk of rotating power outages this evening. Um, we were asked to immediately limit our electricity use to essentials only. Um, this 
this warning did actually uh, elicit a pretty huge response from users across the province. Power demand dropped by about 200 megawatts within minutes. Um, that's the equivalent of around two, 200,000 space heaters or block heaters being shut off. Um, there is, of course, a debate around the regulatory environment that may have contributed to this being necessary. And, you know, we all have our opinions on that. Um, but, of course, I'm no energy policy expert, so I'm going to have to leave that out of the scope of this talk. And we're not necessarily just talking about the uh, sort of localized extremes here. Um, as temperatures rise in general, the demand for cooling will increase, and that means a greater demand for electricity overall. Um, additionally, as heat pump technology adoption broadens, electricity demand for heating will increase in areas where, that it, where it displaces natural gas heating. Um, now, I don't want anybody to, to take that as me advocating against heat pump adoption. Um, I am just pointing out what there's one of the, this is one of the challenges that, um, that it comes with that, uh, that shift. Um, I'd also like to point out that in areas where resistive electric heating, things like baseboard heaters and that, um, where that kind of heating is, uh, is widespread, heat pumps will actually reduce the electricity demand for heating. But so far, what does this really matter to anyone in the insurance industry? Um, from a coverage and claims standpoint, CAT losses tend to mean higher dollar values and higher claim volumes. Um, but are there losses that can occur due to power losses or grid instability that would not occur otherwise? Um, one example that I imagine many of you are pretty familiar with was the situation with refrigerators and freezers in the aftermath of Fort McMurray's uh, 2016 wildfire. The whole city was without power during the extended evacuation. And of course, nobody as they were leaving, were gathering up all their frozen foods or anything. So as a result, the process of dealing with uh, freezers full of spoiled food on an entire city level um, really took on a scale that uh, that was uh, that few likely would have foreseen. Um, so now I do have a case study to talk about relating to a uh, a power loss. So this was a, uh, a, in a school in a small remote town. Um, and this town was located at the end of, end of a road um, along with a mine. Um, the school had a pretty unusual HVAC system. Um, heating and cooling um, was accomplished with an individual unit in each classroom. There were 13 classrooms in the school, including the library. and. Uh, the, uh, there was heat and fire damage identified in 12 out of the 13 ventilation units in each of these rooms. Um, the school was also affected by, um, had been affected by a widespread power outage over the weekend, um, and the smoke and fire damage was discovered on Monday morning by a custodian who had come to open the school for the, for the day. That power outage um, affected about half the town, including the school. Um, and the direct fire damage was pretty limited. It was only found inside these HVAC units in the classrooms. Um, so there was no direct structural fire damage, um, but smoke damage affected pretty much every part of the school. Um, as you can see in this picture, there's, there's sort of a layer of smoke on basically every surface. Um, so this, this smoke damage included student and staff property as well. Um, all the student property had to be either cleaned or replaced, um, and the damaged items included all of the fixtures and fittings and contents of the school, things like library books, textbooks, bulletin boards, gym equipment, not even to mention um, computers and AV equipment. This incident occurred in late May, so the school of course, made no attempt to reopen fully before summer. Um, but still, I mean, it's only three three months until the next school. So direct fire damage um, inside the ventilation units is uh, is shown. You can you can kind of make it out 
here is our best our best view of it in uh, in this particular unit. Um, fire was concentrated to um, devices called VFDs, which is a variable frequency drive. Um, I'll discuss their technical uh, properties um, a little bit more on the next slide. But out of the 13 classrooms, fire damage occurred in 12 of these units. Um, and that was one of the things that really made people wonder about the technical aspects of this fire. I mean, what protected just one? Um, but once I got on scene, interestingly found that um, it was actually 18 out of 26 VFDs that were affected. Um, there was, by coincidence, two out of the eight undamaged units happened to just be in the same in the same uh, ventilation um, box. So what are VFDs? They're, uh, they're a device called a variable frequency drive. Um, they are used to control the speed of AC electric motors, um, which because of their sort of inherent technical limitations are generally used for single speed purposes. Things like elevators, um, home furnace fans, uh, power saws, those kinds of those kinds of devices that only need one speed. Um, the VFD though can be added to the system to allow an AC motor to to have variable speeds. And the way it does it was that it takes income it takes incoming power, it changes the frequency of the wave, like our typical power frequency is 60 hertz in North America, and it changes that frequency to to whatever is required to run the motor at whatever speed is needed. Um, the thing about them though, is that they are sensitive to poor power quality, um, particularly unmatched phases. And these are three phase devices. Um, so the use of VFDs today anyway, is in non-industrial settings is pretty unusual. Um, in modern residential and commercial settings, there are generally other solutions used. Um, but at the time of construction of this school, some of the more modern alternatives were still pretty expensive or were not widely available. So these images show an undamaged um, VFD, this somewhat damaged one with, uh, with patterns indicating heat generation from the inside of the device. And uh, this one here that heated enough to ignite the, uh, the, the plastic casing of the device. Um, so these these devices that you're looking at here are um, are fairly small. They would fit in your hand, really. They're uh, they're about two inches by two inches by four inches tall. Um, so, and I'd like to point out, I'm showing legible markings on this unit, but don't think that in this instance the VFDs were defective. They were just exposed to input power that they can't cope with. Um, also, had the fault been a defective unit. I would expect just one to fail, not two thirds of them in one event. Um, so as I mentioned in the background information, there was a power outage. Um, this incident occurred in BC. So information from BC Hydro, which is a crown corporation, is available through a freedom of information request, including smart meter data. Um, as I was representing the school district, it was, it was pretty easy to get their permission to, as the account holders, for Hydro to release that data. Um, and the power records indicated that only one phase completely failed during the outage while the other two remained on. Um, at times, power also dipped by up to 75% of the nominal voltage. Um, fuses protecting the, the VFDs inside these ventilation units were uh, slow blow type, not fast acting. Um, and no equipment other than the VFDs had damage. So power condi conditions would be expected to lead to um, upset and damage to the VFDs, potentially resulting in fire. Um, and uh, power outage created unpredictable effects in, in those systems. So VFDs can be damaged if one phase drops to about 80% or below relative to the others. There were also pretty wild fluctuations over that time. Um, and it's possible that ordinary fast blow fuses might have prevented that. Um, but in many cases, and in many cases, it is standard practice to use slow blow fuses in circuits for motors, which these were, because they have high startup currents that don't last long. Um, these startup currents don't endanger the supply wiring because they are very short duration. But they can expose equipment like VFDs to larger input variations than they can handle. 
In the end, the power outage create a problem, created a problem in the VFDs and they didn't respond well. Um, while in this instance, the outage was not related to a CAD event, it's easy to see how such a thing could have stemmed from one, creating a larger claim volume from, from one event. Um, so this one was also complicated by a couple of other, a couple of other factors. Um, the, just the, the sheer scale of the loss. Um, also the fact that we had one major party and then hundreds of parties experiencing a small loss, namely the students and staff. Um, and the school did consider some subrogation opportunities, um, but at the end of the day, it wasn't practical to, uh, to pursue BC Hydro, given their, uh, the terms of, of supply. Um, and this is a general thing with power utilities. Um, basically, you have to prove that they caused the damage deliberately. Um, and uh, yeah, this protection is kind of necessary, though. Otherwise, it would be pretty, uh, pretty difficult for, for anybody to assume the mantle of being a power utility. Um, and secondarily, the, the school district is a public entity, just like BC Hydro. So that'll reduce the appetite for pursuing subrogation. Um, there were some considerations of going after the HVAC designer, but the system was pretty old and all the maintenance work in the intervening time was done by the, uh, the school district staff. Um, so in the end, the district just really had to accept the loss and move on. So I do have a second um, case study coming up um, on eroding of safety factors. Uh, so CAD events by their nature are exceptional events. Um, they're often events that are not necessarily contemplated in design, um, or at least not to the extent that they occasionally occur, particularly when we're looking at older building stock. A couple of examples with older building stock um, could include thinking about things like older buildings on the south coast of BC not being fully seismically prepared, um, roof systems being undersized for really extraordinary snow loads, or uh, infrastructure in general. Um, being vulnerable to ice storms. So my second case study um, involves a loss involving a, a number of factors combining to a single failure. Under most conditions, the engineered safety factors would have accounted for, uh, for the failure that we had and prevented it, but given a really extraordinary weather event, those safety factors were consumed and we had failure to fire. Um, so in this image here, we are looking at pretty much the full extent of the direct fire damage. So not all files of this kind are sort of massive individual losses, um, but they can be traced back to larger forces. Um, so this is an image of the same, pretty much the same area, but seen from above. We're in the attic space of a four-story condo building. Um, this coiled cable that you see here was the supply for a large central air conditioning unit. Um, now, this the, the context of this, the timing of it, it happened during the early summer of 2021. Um, and rightly, the big weather story of that time was the, the record-breaking heat in and around Lytton, BC. Um, but that heat dome, um, the, same, the same phenomenon extended into Alberta. Um, and this loss occurred in Edmonton. Um, and here we were, um, we were above 32 Celsius for the entire week, and we peaked at 37 Celsius for, for pretty much a full couple of days, um, which meant that the demand on the air conditioner for this building would have been higher than at any other time in its installed lifespan. Um, it is likely that the system was not designed to experience such extreme temperatures as it did. This was truly record breaking. Um, and in this case, the extreme temperatures pushed the system in several ways. Um, firstly, the AC unit was working harder and at a higher duty cycle than was likely contemplated in design. Um, and by duty cycle, I just mean what percent of the time the unit is on. And it probably would have been pretty close to 100% for many hours. Um, the ambient temperature around the unit was likely higher than ever. Um, AC units work on temperature differentials, and the higher the ambient temperature is, the less efficient the unit can be. Um, 
the temperature in the attic where the power supply conductor was, um, it, the temperature in there would have been well over the 37 degree high on that day, which reduces the electrical conductor's ability to dissipate heat. Um, so this image illustrates that, that section of things. Um, this armored cable, as I said, was the supply for the AC unit. And there was, during installation, I guess there was excess cable that got um, coiled up and left in the attic. Um, the insulation was later blown in over top. Um, and I mean, this isn't ideal, but it's the exact kind of thing that safety factors are introduced to, um, to account for. Um, and uh, so the, the fact that it was coiled sort of multiplies the amount of heat that needs to be dissipated. And then the insulation over top prevents that heat from dissipating into the air. Um, this installation though was not, was not by any means new. Um, it had been through many summers before this where, uh, where no failure occurred. Um, so the safety factors in those closer to normal summers um, were able to, uh, to absorb these less than ideal conditions. Um, whereas when we finally got the really extreme heat that we did in 2021, um, they manifested this way. Um, so really to confirm that the fire was caused by that overheating of conductors and their uh, inability to dissipate heat, the cable was opened up near the area of the direct fa failure. And we're, we're looking at it nearby, a few feet along from the direct failure, um, but not quite at the same spot. Um, these three current carrying conductors in the cable should each have sort of their own independent insulation that can, that can move next to each other. And uh, as you can see in here, they are not quite, they are not separated. And uh, this, um, it would sort of take familiarity, but this sheen that you're seeing here is an unusual thing to see when you open these cables. Um, and here is a, sort of a better view illustrating what, uh, what took place. Um, so the three separate insulation sheaths have fused together here. Um, and if this was allowed to continue, then, uh, which of course it did, um, eventually you would get two of these three conductors making contact, creating a, a short circuit and electrical arcing and ultimately a fire. So here I'm going to pass things over to Alexa for her to, to continue. Thank you. So for my portion, both of my case studies that I am going to get to involve vehicles. So I'm going to go over briefly some of the vehicle systems and how they can fail and possibly resulting in fires. Um, and this is not exhaustive or in depth. It just introduces some of the things that will come up in the case studies. And so when I say vehicle, um, I mean anything from regular passenger vehicles to highway trucks and buses and heavy equipment. But I'm going to be focusing on passenger vehicles because this is just an overview and that is what we see most frequently. So looking at electrical systems and vehicles, there's tons of wires. So we are going to break those down and categorize them into primary and secondary wiring. For the primary wiring in a vehicle, generally these are li larger gauge cables that are connected directly to the battery in the vehicle. Um, and then because they're unfused, they're always energized even when the vehicle is parked. So connected directly to the battery, we'll have the starter, uh, which is on, only used to start your vehicle um, and it engages the engine to start the internal combustion process and then the battery is no longer used to power the vehicle once the engine is on. Uh, then we have the alternator uh, that recharges the battery and powers the rest of the electrical systems 
in the vehicle through the power distribution module. And then for the secondary wiring in a vehicle, generally that's smaller gauge wiring um, that is fused and it's only energized when the vehicle is running. And this can include everything from the windshield wipers, the stereo, the power windows, door locks, headlights, signals, interior cabin lighting, and all the fluid sensors and gauges on your dash. So a couple examples of looking at electrical systems and vehicles. On the left here, we have essentially an undamaged or much less damaged uh, vehicle. Um, and we can see much more obviously in the red here, we've got the, the battery um, and the power distribution in front and the circled in green is the alternator. We can't see the starter in this. But then when we have a much more heavily fire damaged vehicle on the right, um, what we tend to see left at the battery is just the the cells um, and the outer casing is now gone. And then to the right of that, we have what's left of the power distribution module and the fuses that were in that. Um, and then the alternator towards the front is still more recognizable in this case. But when I'd be looking at this, I'd be um, working my way from the battery and following the current flow and tracing all of these major wiring to look for any failures. Um, and when I'm looking for failures on the wiring, we have these three different types. We have short circuit, high resistance, and overloaded wiring. When I say short circuit, I mean arcing between an energized conductor and a ground. And in a vehicle, uh, the ground can be another conductor, another wire, or it can be the body of the vehicle. Um, and this creates an arc with sufficiently high temperature uh, to melt the copper and we can leave, be left with um, sometimes beads and sometimes uh, divots like we see here where it has arced to some part of the body of the vehicle. Um, for high resistance connections, that's when we have a poor connection, uh, which results in lots of current going through a much smaller surface area than it needs. Uh, which causes more heat than there should be because all electricity, all current will cause some amount of heat, but if it's being squeezed through a smaller area than it should be going through, then, then there's too much heat. And at some point that may be enough to ignite the insulation or nearby material. And then also we have overloaded wiring. Um, and that is when we have too much current going throughout the length of a conductor. Um, and we can see that here where it's damaged all along one of these conductors and not the other ones close by. Another, time of another type of electrical failure is of modules themselves inside vehicles and when i'm talking about a module and a vehicle i'm talking about a small computer that controls a specific part of your vehicle uh, for example we have the engine control module or ecm and the body control module or bcm which are the main modules for the engine and passenger compartments of your car um, but then they also communicate with much more specific modules like the brake control module or the driver's drawer module. And all of these have the potential for failure either at the uh, connectors um, coming in or inside of the modules themselves. For example, on here, we can see that this failure on this module occurred where the connectors are coming in. Um, and this one, this module was under the seat uh, of the vehicle and it was damaged after the vehicle was detailed and the seats were washed. Um, and so some water got in there 
uh, causing damage and eventually an electrical failure. Next, I'm talking about the exhaust system. And the purpose of the exhaust system is to get the products of combustion expelled from the engine out the back of the car, away from the occupants. Uh, so we have the exhaust manifold where it's coming off of the engine and going through and filtered and muffled out the tailpipe. The exhaust system components can get hot enough to ignite combustible material. And so in an engine uh, compartment, this can be anything from the liquid spray or leak from any of the liquids inside the engine compartment. This can also be organic material like a uh, rodent nesting. Uh, this can be improperly routed wiring that is then resting upon something like the uh, exhaust manifold. And this can also be intentionally positioned items like a rag if someone wants to ignite their vehicle. And so this type of issue with the exhaust system igniting things is only an issue when the vehicle is on or recently parked because it only stays hot enough for about 20 to 30 minutes after the engine has been shut off. This is the table from NFPA 921 that lists all of the liquids in vehicles. Um, so we have gasoline and diesel and coolant and engine oil, et cetera. Most commonly, uh, we'll see engine oil as the first fuel, um, but all of these can also add to the fire at later points as secondary fuel sources. Looking at the fuel systems in vehicles, in a traditional internal combustion engine, we'll have fuel delivered from the fuel tank with a fuel pump. Um, and this goes through the fuel filter and travels to the engine compartment where we may also have a high pressure fuel pump generally. Um, and it goes to the fuel rail, to the fuel injectors. And any fuel that's not used is returned uh, with other fuel lines. So all of these have the opportunity for locations where leaks can occur. And gasoline is not the most common um, first fuel ignited for our hot surface ignition. Um, but if it's coming, if the leak is coming from a high pressure fuel line, then that atomized spray can be more easier, easily ignited in the engine compartment. More commonly, if we have a leak of the oil or lubrication system, then that is more commonly seen as a fire cause. Um, and purpose of the lubrication system is because engines have lots of moving parts. So oil makes sure that these all slide and turn nicely. So when we look at engines and we're checking over the lubrication system, I'll be looking at things like the oil pan plug to make sure that it's not cross-threaded and there's no leaking from there. I'll be looking similarly at the oil filter to make sure that there's no cross-setting and leaking from there, um, especially if there has been a recent oil change. Um, and then, if the oil is not doing its job well enough, if they haven't had enough oil changes, um, or there's some design flaw or manufacturing defect that is causing the engine to not be lubricated well enough, that can cause increased friction um, on the bearing for the connecting rod on the crankshaft, which can cause the connecting rod to break. And of course, the connecting rod is connecting the crankshaft to the piston that is in the cylinder and making your engine run. So if this 
breaks, your engine doesn't work, but it can also sometimes punch a hole inside in the side of the engine block, which can cause oil to leak and potentially ignite on nearby hot surfaces. So those are the few things that I was going over for vehicles. And now I'm gonna talk specifically about wildfires. Um, and when there's a wildfire, the types of damage and claims that we generally see following them is property damage, uh, vehicle damage, other smoke and soot damage, not without direct fire damage, as well as water damage that was used to extinguish the fire. The case study that I'm looking at um, involved a wildfire that resulted in the insured's claim that included their vehicle. The insured reported that the they left the vehicle um, parked in their driveway when they evacuated with their neighbor's vehicle. Um, and the adjuster, as part of their regular process and checklist, requested their maintenance records for the vehicle, which they were not able to provide and they seemed rather defensive and the reasons that they gave didn't seem good enough for the adjuster and it raised some red flags and that's why I was brought in to investigate further. So this is what the engine compartment looked like. Very severe fire damage. Um, Fire is very destructive, um, but there are some things that we can still look for that can be evidence of the vehicle's condition or any failures to the vehicle that can still remain, um, that cannot be caused by fire. So that's really what I was looking for um, as a focus, because we already know that the fire originated kilometers away. We're not concerned with what caused the fire. Um, so I proceeded to a destructive examination since the clients are not looking to assign responsibility for the claim. They're just concerned with, with the, the quantum for this loss, with, with what this vehicle was valued at and making sure there wasn't any other failures that pre-existed the fire. So when the engine was disassembled, I dropped the oil pan. Um, and looking at the underside of the crankshaft, um, the connecting rod and piston in cylinder three were missing. Um, the damage that was present, and damage was present on the other connecting rod bearings, um, which indicated catastrophic engine failure. So here we have lined up, these are the bearings, for the connecting rods that are, this would have been cylinder one, two, and then three is not there, um, and four would have been here. So on those bearings, um, there was wear that indicated that there was not enough lubrication in this engine, which like resulted in, in cylinder three um, failing. And, this type of failure, uh, we know that the vehicle experienced catastrophic engine failure, but catastrophic engine failure can only occur while the vehicle is running um, and it does not always result in a fire. Um, and it cannot be caused by fire damage. So this told us that the insureds were concealing the fact that the vehicle was not in working order prior to being damaged by the wildfire and inflating the cost. Next, I'm looking at heavy rain and flooding. And when we have flooding, some of the types of damage and claims that we generally see involve HVAC systems, uh, plumbing systems, and damage to electrical systems, which if not addressed, um, if not recognized as an issue, can result in fires as a result of the electrical failures. So my second and last case study was a vehicle fire and the circumstances of the fire discovery. Um, it was being driven by the time 
and a fire broke out at the rear of the passenger compartment. So this is like the trunk area. Um, and then the insured also reported that they had previously been living in the state. So the car was brought up from there um, and there was maintenance records of previous repairs or maintenance done in the states, um, but there was nothing done in the area of the fire origin. So we got to the joint exam, we took off this back cover and we are looking at a failure of the rear window defogger. This was the only thing in the area um, that failed and it was very minimal fire damage. So it was very easy to find the origin and the failure, but now we need to know why did it fail? There's no recalls on the defogger. There's no recent repairs in the area. So is this possibly a manufacturing defect or is there anything else we need to rule out? Um, looking at um, weather history and the time of the location where the vehicle was previously located in the States, um, Weather history showed that heavy rain and flooding had occurred during that time while they were living there with the vehicle. Um, but we still have to then look for evidence as to whether or not we can confirm that this vehicle was in the flood or was affected by the flood. So one of the places to check for flood damage um, is in the drain plug of the doors of the vehicle, um, a boroscope just being a camera on the end of a flexible tube. So we removed the drain plug and stuck the boroscope in there to take pictures. And in there, we're looking for evidence of water damage and organic material that indicates a vehicle had experienced heavy flooding and rain conditions. And as you can see here, we do have debris um, and organic material and water damage. And this physical evidence combined with the fact that the historical weather data for the state city where the vehicle was previously um, indicated that the vehicle had experienced um, and been through heavy rain and flooding. And due to this evidence of the flood damage, uh, we were unable to eliminate that there was corrosion um, caused by this undue exposure to water on the electrical components, which led to overheating and eventual ignition and failure of the rear window defogger. So it just meant we were unable to um, pursue the manufacturer um, as a result of this. Thank you so much for listening. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you, Martin. Okay. This is uh, the time for questions. If we have any, again, it's the questions drop down in the go to webinar control panel. Um, so let's just give everyone a couple minutes to get these in. There's one here that uh, came in martin while you were presenting maybe i missed this it's just uh csst question mark did you mention something about a csst uh no i don't remember that uh perhaps i misspoke about something and was misheard but uh well, if that's uh, well if that's your your question to the person who asked it um maybe uh you could uh just possibly clarify uh, or maybe maybe that's a typo may have meant for someone else um Uh, Alexa, sorry, did you, again, maybe did I miss something, mention uh, damage caused in a car wash? Um, 
I did not mention damage caused in a car wash, but it sounds like they might be asking how could we rule out that this was as a result of the water, was it as a result of flooding and rain as opposed to car wash damage? Um, and I can't see a car wash having any of that organic material that we see in there. Um, and a car wash shouldn't be submerging a vehicle in water, which is going to give more of that damage to the vehicle and more opportunity for it to flood with water as opposed to a car wash, which is applying water to the vehicle more in a expected scenario, which is more akin to like regular rain and not submerging the vehicle. Okay. Sense. Thank you. No, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, there's no question. This is just a comment. Someone taking a shot at Albertans uh, regarding the cold stuff in Alberta. Bear in mind, at West, it's a dry cold, unlike Eastern Canada and the Maritimes, where it's really cold. Um, I'm in Toronto. I'm not going to comment on that. You take any umbrage with that uh, comment, Martin? Uh, you know what? I spent seven years in Vancouver, and um, after about three winters there, it did start to feel cold there. <laughs> it, I I feel weird even admitting that now. And then when I moved back to Edmonton, it took about three winters to get used to it again. Right. So, yeah. Well, we've got a former Edmontonian living in Ontario now, and they say it's bone chilling here. So. I didn't say it, it's someone else. Uh, oh, question here. How could you discern the door debris in the vehicle? It wasn't simply built up over time um, and not due to a specific flood. We wouldn't expect to see that built up over time. Um, we wouldn't expect to see any amount of debris in there akin to this because you would need sort of a, a one big rainfall to get enough of that debris that like sits in there for long enough to get that type of leftover debris. Okay. All right, well, we'll give everyone uh, a couple more minutes. Here's a clarification on the car wash one. The comment, there was a comment of a component that had been damaged earlier in a car wash. Um, we'll, uh, yes. you know, we... So that was not just like a, an exterior car wash. That was detailing on the inside where water was used to wash this, like the interior seat. Um, and like too much water was used in that instance, um, which then damaged under the seat. Okay, there we go. I think that clears things up. Yeah. Uh, Two, well, two questions. Um, either of you can can take these on if you like. Uh, electric vehicles, um, any comments on fires or uh, load on the grid? Um, in terms of fires, the we are seeing, I think this is a, um, there's potential that it's sort of a, it, since it's a new thing, 
we're seeing a statistically outsized degree in terms of quantity of buyers. Um, I believe that electric vehicles, um, based on everything that I've read about it, uh, the likelihood of a fire is lower than an internal combustion engine um, vehicle. But when you get them, they are pretty serious. Um, so it's a uh, it happens less, but it's more. It can be more severe when it happens, um, and the uh, yeah. So we're seeing we're seeing a lot more of that, and also since it's a new thing, they get they get attention. That's for sure. Yes, I I am going to agree and add a little bit. They are definitely less common to ignite to start fires but once they do catch fire if it gets to the battery if it gets to the big battery underneath the vehicle then it is very hard to put out um, and sometimes manufacturers will recommend just letting it burn itself out um, i don't have the statistics in front of me but the amount of water needed to put out a regular internal combustion engine is um like hundreds of times less than what it takes to put out an electric vehicle fire okay no great answer both okay i think uh we're pretty much at our time here um i mean if you guys want to stick around if any questions come up we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, and then we're coming in with our final presentation so let's let's make that for 2 30 um and then yeah then we'll, we'll wrap things up okay thank you alexa thank you martin again